Hi, I'm Brad Templeton from Robocars.com. Welcome back to this two-part video on what's in the way of you riding in a self-driving car. In part one, which you'll see above and in the description, we started the list of problems to be solved before you can ride in a Robocar. The list included proving the vehicles are actually safe enough, getting better at predicting what people will do in the future, and getting faster at sensing surprises. Now we'll look at some other challenges teams are working hard to solve. Making vehicles safe and proving it is one thing. Another important skill might be called road citizenship. Namely, being a productive driver on the road, not getting in other people's way, not impeding traffic, not acting unpredictably. In the early days, all robocars tend to be programmed to drive conservatively in order to stay safe. There's almost a dial you can turn between being conservative and safer and being assertive and not slowing traffic. The natural instinct is to turn the dial to conservative when you begin, but it can't stay there forever. You might make a very safe car, but can't deploy it if it's always getting honked at or blocking lanes while it waits for the safest moment. A notorious problem for many robocars, and also for humans, is the unprotected left turn. There's a worry about including oncoming traffic, traffic behind you, pedestrians entering crosswalks, and more. Waymo has been famously criticized for trying hard to avoid even doing these turns, to the point that it will pick a longer route with three right turns to avoid that unprotected left, even when it's not a good strategy for the rider. Crews just had their first injury accident in an unprotected left when another car was speeding and came through the intersection. Senior citizens have higher accident rates as they age, and a lot of those new accidents are during unprotected lefts. Because others want to make the turn behind you, you can't dawdle here, nor can you in many other places. There is speculation that some of the accidents where robocars have been rear-ended were partly caused by the car pausing too long in a way that was unexpected. In some cities, you won't get anywhere if you're not assertive. Waymo found that over 10 years ago that you had to be assertive at four-way stops or you would not get through them. Tesla got in trouble with regulators when they allowed their cars to do slow rolling stops at empty four-way stops, even though that's not dangerous and most humans do it. Mobileye has built an entire planning methodology it calls Responsibility Sensitive Safety, or RSS, which defines the driving options a car has to keep it legal and responsible while allowing it to be more aggressive. In many countries, we know that almost all human drivers exceed the speed limit, and those who don't become a barrier to traffic. Companies are very reluctant to deliberately program cars to break the law even if breaking the law is needed for good road citizenship. And that's a problem. While these problems sit in the way of many teams, it should be noted that robo-taxi service has been deployed now in several towns. Waymo has had full-time robo-taxi service with nobody in the vehicle deployed in one suburb of Phoenix for several years and they just expanded to the downtown of Phoenix and to the non-downtown parts of San Francisco. Cruz operates with no safety driver at night in the same area of San Francisco. Several Chinese companies have service, although there is an employee not in the driver's seat in most cases, in Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and other Chinese cities. Baidu just removed the safety driver in Wuhan and Chongqing. Several other companies have had pilot services with human safety drivers in a variety of towns, and even more services are planned for the near future in places like Dubai, Miami, Las Vegas, Munich, Tel Aviv, and many more. These are pilots. But even after all these companies go into commercial deployment, which they hope to do within just a couple of years at most, you won't see service everywhere. It's actually expensive to deploy a robo-taxi fleet in a town. Not only do you have to buy or build thousands of cars, but you must test and certify that you can operate well in that town and make nice with local officials and maybe do some marketing. It takes money and management time. 
even companies like Google, Apple, and GM, who have more money than several small countries, can't deploy everywhere in the USA, and certainly not the world at once. So it will be done a few cities at a time. How quickly it comes to your city will depend on how easy it is to operate there, how friendly the government is, and what sort of weather you have, and how good a business serving your town will be. If you live in the country, a robo-taxi service isn't coming until the 2030s, probably. Robo-taxis may exist in some towns and come to more, but you can only ride in them. You can't buy them. In fact, all the leading self-driving teams are trying to make robo-taxis, not a car that you can buy. Tesla hopes to offer a self-driving function for people who buy their cars, but they are very far behind the leading teams. They have bet on hoping for an unpredictable breakthrough that drives on any road and can do it with just the cameras they put in the cars back in 2016. Driving everywhere is really hard. So hard that the smart teams don't think it's the goal to try for first. So hard that nobody is even remotely close to doing it. A robo-taxi drives a limited area that you can test and verify. It will never dive down a street you've never seen before. It comes home to the depot every night to get updates if it needs them in service. It's much easier to make things work in that environment than to make a car you sell to a customer never to see again. This is a problem for traditional automakers who sell cars to customers. They can't make a car that just drives itself in a few cities. Nobody would buy the Chevy Tahoe if it only works at Lake Tahoe. No one city or state is big enough a market for a car model from a big car company. Most teams focus on driving, understandably. But cars have to also handle picking up and dropping off passengers which is not just the work of pick up and drop off the Russian chauffeur on car talk, but an essential part of giving rides. I call it P-U-D-O, or PUDO. While doing this is not rocket science, it involves a lot of detail work, understanding the curb and every spot on it, as well as driveways and parking lots. The road is actually simple compared to those, and each bit of curb has its own rules, and each private lot can have its own signs and new laws. Even human drivers have trouble with it, Robocar teams have all started by first handling driving, leaving the PUDO to later. Crews launched their service in San Francisco without doing PUDO. Operating only at night on quiet streets, they just stopped in the lane to pick up and drop off passengers. They aren't the only ones. It's not unusual to see cabs and Uber drivers doing the same thing. The city did not like it, though. They want companies to solve this before they deploy. Some companies solve it by only doing PUDO in a limited set of spots, and you might have to walk a short distance, like to a bus stop, to get your ride. For full deployment, all this detail work has to be done. Pilot robotaxis are on the road, but before they spread around the world, companies have to settle on at least a first draft of a business model. All of them have started with Uber or taxi-style service, pay a fare to take a ride. That's a start, and can even make money, but they didn't invest tens of billions just to be a cheaper Uber. In fact, those that are charging money for rides today aren't doing that to get revenues. The money charged is a drop in the bucket of their current costs. They only do it as a dress rehearsal, to see how customers use the product when they have to pay for it. The final business model might be a cheaper version of Uber, but it's more likely they'll try other approaches like subscriptions or mixed fees in order to get it right and to convince customers to give up owning at least one of their cars and replace it with the robotaxi service. That's where the real revenue is. This isn't a full blocker, though. They can get the cars out there without the right business model. They just won't make money the way that they hope to. Another thing for a usable robocar service involves some UI in the car. It also requires a mobile app, so people can summon cars and give them new instructions and pay for the rides. That's not a great challenge. It's similar to the work of creating the Uber app. But it's not nothing either, and you need this before people can use it.
Making the vehicle safe was the first challenge teams went after, and some have achieved that. Proving that it's safe was the next challenge, which is not complete for most teams. But one of the barriers is they want to prove it's reached a level of safety that is actually too high. By shooting for the moon, they are slowing down deployment. You may ask, how can a level of safety be too high? Perfect safety isn't attainable, and aiming for it is a fool's errand. But there's much debate about what amount of safety is enough. Developers are afraid of causing harm, both because they are generally good people and because causing accidents would easily derail or even destroy their projects. Lawsuits over robocar accidents will be far more costly than ordinary car accidents in most cases, so much more expensive that they could erase the benefits that come from having many fewer accidents. There is a giant insurance industry that has streamlined and reduced the cost paid in accidents. Some would say it's done this too well. But accidents caused by robots owned by deep-pocketed corporations will not get any of that reduction. In some places, things are being held up by both legal issues and public acceptance. You can't deploy unless you're confident it's legal, and even then, you have problems if you think the public will reject it. In many states in the USA, states were eager, even proactive, to declare that at least testing of vehicles was legal. It started off legal because, of course, nobody thought to write no robots in the vehicle codes. Since then, there's been a wide variety of approaches by states and countries to the legality of deploying real services. Most people know that robocars will change the world, and for the better, and they don't want to be late to the game. So for now, governments are trying to move quickly to define it as legal. This will happen more quickly in the USA and China than it does in Europe, though. A surprising opponent may be transit agencies, who usually see all transportation through the lens of public transit and view transit as a goal rather than a means. Some see robocars as competition, as Uber has been, but rather than reacting to the competition by improving and outcompeting, as government agencies, they may fall to the temptation of impeding things with regulations. This happened to companies that made vanpool services that took riders away from transit and then were pushed out of their business. The other risk is pre-regulation, which is to say attempts to write rules for robocars before they're even deployed on the road. The normal history of new automotive safety technologies was to allow them to be deployed for many years before regulations were written, and the eventual regulations mostly just required all the laggard automakers to start including these great new things like seatbelts, anti-lock brakes, and collision avoidance technology. Even the best teams don't know the final form of their product yet, and the regulators certainly don't either. The public has to accept you too. Some of the public are eager, and some are afraid. In Waymo's early territory, there have been a few cases of the public being more than verbally resistant, but that might change if teams aren't careful about their public image. Even so, this does not seem to be a problem. The public is amazingly accepting of new technology like this, trusting it even before they should. There are some tasks that need to be done, but they're not blockers to early deployment. People are working on them, but they don't have to complete them before you get to ride in a robocar. One area which shows up a lot in press demos, because it shows well, is the design of special interiors and functions to do while you ride. People like to dream of a car of the future that looks quite different from 20th century cars, but you don't actually need this. Teams are trying hard to figure out good user interfaces, and several companies are even custom designing new future vehicles from the ground up. We'll like these things in the future, but for now people will be content with just the standard comfort of the back seat of a taxi today, just staring at their phone. That's what everybody does now in the back of Ubers and on any transit vehicle, and it gets the job done. It's also not needed to make a car that can drive everywhere. You might want that in a car or sold to end users, but a robo-taxi service only needs to serve a commercially viable set of routes, and it need not even be that viable during the growth phase. That's why teams are putting the focus on places without snow or subsets of towns. They can go live without going everywhere and get to more places later.
So, again, everyone wants to know when, and the answer to that is when you will ride. It's June 23rd, 2023, at 4.14 Pacific Time. Well, no. And anybody who names a date is foolish. The real date is different in every city, and it depends on these blockers. All this said, for many of you, it may not be too long before you ride in your robo-taxi. In the world's lucrative warmer cities, you might see that now or by the mid-2020s. You'll certainly see it on a trip before too long. If you have snow, don't worry. Many are eager to solve that problem soon as there is too much of a market there. You will also soon see regular cars you can buy that can handle all the main highways. That's a useful, if not world-changing product, but would give a lot of time back to commuters and intercity voyagers. And who knows? Maybe Tesla or somebody else will get that breakthrough that they're willing to let loose on a road they never tested on before. I hope you enjoyed this series. If you're interested in more analysis of self-driving and the future of transportation, stay tuned to this channel for more interesting videos. I'm Brad Templeton.